Mindset Game Podcast, and I'm your host, James Roberts. I'm a two-time Paralympian, online training and nutrition coach, and owner of James Roberts Fitness. You can find more of my content by going to my website, fitamputee.co.uk. But before we get started with today's show, first off, let me take this opportunity to welcome back the regular listeners. And if this is your first time listening to the show, I hope you enjoy this episode and decide to subscribe to the show. And on today's show, I've got Francis Bateman. Francis had a life-changing rugby accident in 2011. She is a former member of the British Para Canoe, competing in the VAR class. At the time, she was ranked number one in Britain and world number two in 2015. Unfortunately, she had a reclassification and is no longer within the program. Uh, More recently, she's now taken up surf kayaking, competing alongside able-bodied athletes as a disabled athlete. So welcome onto the show, Francis. Hey, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on, James. It's my pleasure. So before we delve into today's episode, Francis, can you talk about, obviously, the mindset that you had coming back from your initial setback with having that injury initially coming from rugby? Yeah, definitely. Um, so when I first had the accident, it was a bit of a shock, um, as you might imagine. Um, but it was also a brain injury, so quite lack of awareness. I guess I to not be able to do stuff. So with the lack of awareness of what I can do, am I like being able to push myself? It set me up quite nicely and um, in fact all the therapists were telling me to slow down and rest to give myself time to recover. Um, But yeah, that positive mindset, that finding ways around things um, has definitely helped enormously with my recovery. And then obviously you went on to do um, para-canoeing and obviously I've heard the background story of you from probably my Welsh connections, but for the listeners... Can you kind of divulge why you kind of went down that route and went into that sport as opposed to any number of Paralympic sports you could have chosen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've Well, I've now been canoeing for 20 years. It's been a life from my accident and... Um, I'd sort of retired from the competitive side, but was still doing quite a lot of river running. But I'd been doing an awful lot of coaching, and I was definitely expanding my coaching, um, doing like coaching development, getting through my coach education, qualifications, and things like that, um, to be able to coach other coaches and doing a lot of uh, development work. So, um, yeah, when I first had my accident, I didn't think I'd be able to get back into a boat, or certainly not on the terms that I'd want to. So... First time I got into a boat and like realised I could sit up straight and move it, even though I got tired dead quickly, I was like, ah, oh, it was amazing. <laughs> you just can't, uh, doesn't quite describe the words because it's sort of been something that's been part of my life for such a long time, both as a career and as a hobby. So, yeah. And you talked to me off air, obviously, of your reclassification and obviously you kind of divulge that the event that you did has been selected for the men's but not the women's. Can you kind of talk to me kind of how devastating that's been as an athlete? Um, I mean, just just losing your classification, especially when it's unexpected and not because you're really getting better. It's, um, it's a really tough one. It's really hard because... Um, like when you have your accident, you can work towards like yourself. When you be to win everything into it, um, and that's kind of taken away from you. There's no amount of work. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, you kind of just have to change direction and move on. But in terms of that goal, that is gone completely gone and um that that's really tough one to you know come back from and try and keep positive through because 
you know, yeah, the, it, it's out of your control. And I think that's probably the hardest thing, that there was nothing I could find within my control, you know, to continue um, with it. So, but luckily I find another competitive sport. But in terms of language, but in terms of obviously your yeah. classification <laughs> being unknown, did even the governing body know that it could be a possible reality that could arise, or did they? Or were they completely shocked as well? Um, I know that like all of the coaches. And everyone were really surprised because I'd actually been, when I lost my classification, I'd been struggling quite a lot with my walking um, and my left ankle. But I had less control. My problem's more to do with control. Uh, um, but the strength of the is really my and they can be the master to all. You know, everyone at British Canoeing, it was a massive shock to the classifiers. And they they were really upset as well because, but I suppose I was trying to fit Ryan Pegg into a square hole with um, the fact that I was, you know, fitting into a strength and range of movement classification, which I've got a decrease in strength down my left-hand side. Um, but my bigger problem is the control element. So... Yeah, it was a huge shock for everyone. You know, a pretty good thing. The psychologist will work with you and make sure that you know that that's something. You know, you always know that you could get reclassified, but kind of... And that's always on the back of every athlete's mind, however stable their condition, I think if you do parasol, but I guess, you know, you don't, you don't expect it to, um, be you, and I guess I'd let my guard down, and, because I, you know, I've been through the first set, and, um, in my head, my leg was worse, so the physios watching me move right, my leg was worse, (laughs) um, you know, it's just one of those hard things. Um, so I think it would have been which would have made it a lot less of a shock. But, you know, that was really, really soft, but it still, when it actually happens, doesn't stop how, how utterly devastating it is. Yeah. But how you explain it to me, it's quite difficult to see how they came to that conclusion because you, you say that you've got less um, control, but then to a certain extent that is going to involve strength elements. So to to say that you've increased in strength, I would argue that would not be the case because obviously you've got that limiting functionali- uh, functionality to be able to do a task, so it's a kind of a catch-22, really. Yeah, you know, that's where it was seen, whereas if I'm trying to do it without someone controlling my ankle, it just wobbles down to the side, and I just can't, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, um, and it is just because it's, it's not a classification that is set up for people with brain injuries and stuff like that. It's set up for people with, you know, spinal injuries and um, lower leg amputees, really. And, well, amputees in general. Uh, um, so it's it's one of those things. It's um, it's really hard to explain. It's really hard to understand myself. Like, it's, but it is what it is. <laughs> and you can't change that. Um, you know, I still have to walk with my leg brace. I I sort of like some of the extra 
expectation and my thunder yeah. and yeah. move on and try and work out what you're going to do with your life next and that's all part of the you know the performance mentality that headset is like going okay things have gone to rubbish and um I'm back at you know I've got a new challenge how am I going to rebuild myself how am I going to find my way through this and be okay and carry on and I guess you know it's the same skill set is what helped me get back from my accident in the first place that has sort of got me back to where I am now and obviously you've now moved on to uh, surf kayaking did it was it kind of a so to speak an easier transition to make because you've the crossover is quite similar yeah so um that's quite true but after paddling at quite a high level in moving water for a lot of years i'm i'm picking it up quickly there's some parts like learning how to surf like a surfer in a kayak which is a lot harder and i'm on a steep learning curve at the moment with that i keep making mistakes and when i do i I get a bit of a beating, <laughs> but that's okay. You just get back up and carry on. Um, yeah. Yeah, my pan, the panning uh, in the past is definitely up in the next level where I'm. And I just have to surf hiking back, actually. I'm on here to run a disability paddling day every year in Paris, and the wind had picked up and it was cancelled. Um, and this day was on in Pembrokeshire, so I just went along and um, really enjoyed it. So I've been travelling to the coast quite a lot, <laughs> which is great fun. But then for the listeners, can you explain kind of the mindset you now have to be in, obviously going from a predominantly disabled sport to now one that is quote-unquote uh maybe less so inclusive and you're competing against able-bodied people. Can you kind of explain how that's kind of had to change your mindset? Um, I'd say, like, I've got to accept that certain things are a little bit trickier and I have problems so around things. Structure. I'm involved in the body processing. A lot of the guys I was competing against didn't have that problem anyway, if that makes sense. And when I was paddling in VAR, there were very few people with problems with their upper limbs and stuff like that. So, because my hand, my arm, my go all the way down my left hand side, expected. So in a way, I was having to different issues. They have their issues, my issues slightly different. Um, and so in that way, it's not that much different. What I do find is I have to be very open and upfront about my injury so that I get help getting on and off the water, get my boat carried up the side. You know, if you're on a paraclete program, you've got people there that are, helping you that's that's part of their job that's part of their role and sometimes especially when I'm in a boat uh, I have to remind people well actually just say that again yeah I'm, I'm having problems understanding what you're saying say it a bit slower and because of processing um because in a boat where my left hand side is connected to my right hand side my problems become a lot less obvious so I get really tired um because you get the connectivity, it lets me know where what my left hand side of my body is, and I don't generally know where it is in time and space. If that makes sense, that's a part of the thing. Um, but I guess on the other hand, not everyone doing surf biking's got 20 years of experience behind them, and 20 years of being in a boat, and like things like a lot of the girls paddle against. Where I used to do a lot of big steep rivers. If it's a really big day, things like dealing with fear, um, I'm I'm actually quite experienced with dealing with that and the competitiveness of dealing with my nerves at big events and things like that. Um, Again, that experience actually gives me advantage 
of having been on a high performance program the, the guys in surf kayak where it's not got a massive supporting structure with it um they don't have that experience they haven't had that help that i've had so in a way it equals out yes i've got my physical disability and my processing issues but my sporting background gives me quite a big advantage over a lot of people as well so yeah and Francis, you talk about that steep learning curve you've had. Can you kind of divulge some of the, and you talk to me about this off air, some of the successes you've had in a quick, um, how would I even word it, a qu- quick short space of time? Yeah, yeah. So um, I was lucky enough to go out to the World Championships I um, with the Welsh team. I went out as reserve and one of the girls injured herself, unfortunately. And um, so I got on and paddled for the Welsh team as well as in the individuals. Um, And, yeah, we came third in the world, the Welsh team did, which is amazing. Um, And then in the short boat classification, which is like the short surfboards um, with the deck on top, I'm 13th in the world. And in the long boat, I'm um, 15th in the world, which blew my mind. (laughs) But, yeah, it was a definitely massively steep learning curve out there. Um, having, like, where, when I used to play in the surf as a kayaker, I used to surf a bit more like a bodyboarder, so you play about in the white stuff and things like that. And I used to do a bit of what they call freestyle kayaking, where you do tricks in the wave and things, but you'd be in the white bit of the wave. Whereas surfing, you go and diagonally across the beach, and you don't score points unless you're on the green bit. If you're in the white bit and you can do the most awesome move, scores nothing. Um, so getting my head around that and learning how to surf a boat with fins, um, you know, really steep learning curve. And the hardest thing is learning to read the waves so that I know if it's going to close that on me, which means it's climate. That's with you. It's, it's the most powerful part of the wave but with the extra speed and stuff you get loads more stability and you can do loads more moves and really work it to rank up those points um mm-hmm. so yeah the the world's was massively challenging um I went out in the first day of the competition. It was a massive storm. Went out in the, some of the most challenging conditions I've been in. Uh, I was really glad I've done some big rivers before because I needed every ounce of experience to control my fear. Um, and, um, but yeah, then the competition had like, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't and uh, really made some good decisions, good experience. Um, yeah, so hopefully in 2019 at Next World, so I'm going to be able to read the waves a bit better and I'm going to be able to increase my rankings, hopefully significantly. We'll see. <laughs> but then also I've got this question for you, Francis. Obviously you live in, how would I even word it for the listeners? Um, obviously, um, well, you could put, say a remote part of the country within Wales, but Obviously, with it being now you've transitioned to uh, surf kayaking, what are some of the uh, logistical uh, and probably tra- probably not logistical and challenging things you have got to overcome? Obviously, because you are a long way from the coast, being inland. Yeah, well, that that is a massive issue. Um, although I did have to travel to Nottingham from Brecon for training, um, but yeah, travelling to the coast, so. A lot of time, I went to a lot of sitting training is really hard. Um, so what I try to do is, if I know that I've got a weekend where I can do go and join friends to a number of short sessions and, you know, get a few days worth and just stay over near the coast. And then the rest of the time I swim for my fitness because you're actually using the same muscles. So, 
Um, and I actually swim competitively as well now. Um, and I do competitive swimming training three times a week. Um, with Merthyr Tudville Swimming Club, in fact, who are excellent. I'm going to give them a plug. Um, and um, that really helps keep my fitness up. So when I get to the surf, it's not fitness. I'm literally concentrating on the tactical and technical elements of surf kayaking. So really, you know, learning how to read those little bumps that are coming in the horizon, make sure that I'm in the sweet spot. But yeah, without the fitness that I can do at home and, you know, with the local swimming club, um, I wouldn't be able to do it because I just wouldn't have the strength, you know, all the endurance to keep doing it because it is a you know it is tough and if you get it right it's sweet and the moves are quite easy if you get it a fraction wrong it's it can be really hard work um to get yourself into the right position to score those points so yeah and you talked about obviously relying on friends and family to be able to do certain aspects of training do you also have to be reliant on the weather forecast, but it being very much a sport reliant on, I would say, wind to a certain extent and and waves? Do you, um, well, it wouldn't be just the weather forecast, but obviously do you have to be more engaged with that kind of technology so you can get the best out of the yeah. training? Yeah, I need to know, like what the wind, what the swell's doing, what sort of swell it is, um, and then think about which beaches are facing which way, depending on which coast I head towards, really. Um, yeah, it makes a real difference. And sometimes you can say, oh, your energy all week, things are going to come in, or, you know, good conditions, get good training conditions, chatty and it'll be rubbish, and then you can't train for it. So it takes quite a lot more planning. Um, but then I guess if I lived on the coast, it would be easier to get there, but then unless I lived in an area with beaches that faced in all different directions, you know, it's pretty difficult to get consistent surf. Um, yeah. I paddled out to a tidal race called The Bitches the other day, which is pretty cool. Um, and um, you can certainly, you know, surf on place, place spots like that, which that's a tidal race. So it's much more predictable, you know. If I'm living so far standing up, I'm going to go south and I can get down to the southwest of England fairly easily as well if I need to. So it's a long drive, whichever, but it doesn't feel so bad because I'd be having a long drive anyway. Um, <laughs> if that makes any sense. But then coming back from this point of view now, Francis, which is probably more um, of a logistical nightmare and, and more, uh, we could say, detrimental on you as a disabled athlete, the travelling to Nottingham when you're part of the para canoe or the travelling you have to do now as part of surf kayaking? It's different. I mean, I had a really strong routine when I did para canoe, and I think that's possibly been the most devastating thing about losing my place on the programme. Um, processing issues, things like planning my line decisions, things like that. Um, to drive up to Nottingham didn't feel like much because all I did was eat, sleep, train, repeat, or I was driving to training. It literally, like, I and I had a friend that I rented a room off in Nottingham as well, so I'd go up for three or four day blocks mm -hmm. and then come back home and do some training at home on the canal at home as well. So um, so I'd have a big, you know, really highly structured coach, and the way it's set up at Nottingham is that literally I can get off the water, get dry, 
stick myself something to eat in the athlete lounge, have a kit, get up, train again, and do that again. So um, that really strict routine, I really miss, and that that I find really hard to live without. Um, as far as driving to the coast, I mean, the nice thing is, is that if I'm not well or feeling fatigued, it's really easy to go, oh, I'm just not going to go this weekend. Um, but on the other hand, it takes a lot more self-motivation to not be lazy and to make sure that you do get the training in and to hit the goals. Uh, as I said, like, fitness is because you know that you've got that consistent level then of fitness, of being able to having the strength to pad light and against the waves and things because it's, yeah, it's quite committing because you're in the boat. If it's a fairly big day, you've still got to get out back to get onto those green waves and that's that's quite hard work. Um, you know, so you need to have the base level of fitness to do that, I guess. But you talked about there, Francis, obviously that consistency uh, of having a, a routine and you do swim in anyway, and you've talked about this off air to me briefly. Why, why not I divulge all your time and effort into probably going into para, uh, para, uh, Paralympic swimming as opposed to doing surf kayak? And obviously, you, you, there's that unknown of where classification could land you, and obviously, if you wanted to progress higher. But what is your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, swimming, it's uh, deciding if I want to go into classification, then if I want to go back into para sport and train full time, mm -hmm. or if I want to be developing other parts of my life. Um, and at the moment, surf kayaking lets me develop other parts of my life. It, you know, it's a, it's quite. People take it very seriously, but it's a social sport rather than a completely elitist sport. You know, people don't train full time because um, they can't. They've got jobs to work around. It's not funded and things like that. Um, but I mean, I found even going into para canoe initially, the whole classification thing quite stressful. And I'm sure a lot of para athletes would just being classified and having to show what you can't do goes very much against my psyche and um I don't it you know it's making that decision really do I want to do that do I want to put myself through that level of stress and then as well well there's classification reviews going on in nearly every sport with IPA like do I want to get there and then get comfortable and then have things changed underneath me it might work in my favor it might not but do, do I want to put myself through that again um or is it you know I'm I'm 36 now is it time to start thinking well actually what am I going to do with the rest of my life and um where am I moving on to um sporting goals are really important to me which is why I've picked up the surf kayaking and I love doing the swimming as well. Um, and I need to keep doing a certain amount of sport to keep my health. Um, but as well, you, you've got to have life beyond sport. At some point you've got to retire as an athlete. Um, and I guess like there's a, do I want to put myself through classification again? I think just with the way how mine ended, um, that's quite a big decision for me. That was really quite traumatic. Um, but then the other thing is, you know, I am that bit older and, you know, I could have another cycle or two left in me, but which do I want to do? Do I want to, like, be able to go to my friend's weddings? Do I want to be able to go to the hen parties and you know, be able to have a drink and celebrate with them and, you know, stuff like that, which as a high performance athlete on a programme, you, you have to stop doing. You you lose quite a lot of freedoms. Um, you gain masses from it. But, you know, 
So it's just like, it's just having that time out and really considering the options. And at the moment, the fact that I've got surf kayaking that gives me the goals and the motivation to keep my fitness up, you know, keep doing my physio to a high level um, to be as physically able as I can be um, while looking at other areas is brilliant. So I'm actually doing a master's in sports coaching and high performance at the moment, very part time um, with the University of South Wales, which is pretty cool. So it's like, it is looking at those next stages and thinking, well, where am I going? And I think, like, if I do know where I'm going, I think I'd be happier to put myself through the stress of classification. Because if it did suddenly just come from underneath me, which it could, um, and it can for any athlete, really, um, then... Um, or, you know, your event gets dropped from the Paralympics. And, you know, these things these things happen frequently in Paris sport. Um, I want to know that I know where I'm going and know where I want to go. Because I think being able to perform, um, one of the key things towards that is actually being comfortable with your next moves so that you can put everything in. You know, because, yeah, if you're going to go and compete internationally on funded programs in Paris sport at that level, you've got to give it 100% because anything less than that isn't good enough. It's hard work. There's some brilliant competitors out there. And, um, you know, you've got to work hard to stay in there. So, yeah. But, Francis, do you, do you not think, and this is probably... I've alluded to this probably in the past, but do you, do you think that the outside perspective, uh, be it from family, friends, uh, the wider community, kind of don't understand or get to terms with why an athlete wants to call time on their career? Because, well, from the outside perspective, maybe less so your family and friends, they only see you for that short space of time, be it a World Championships, Europeans, Paralympics, and they assume, well, they, they, they mu- there mustn't be a complexity that goes with it, which is horrifies me at times, because it's like, well, that, for an athlete, you've got to be able to peak at that certain moment, so there's got to be mm-hmm. some massive, uh, well, the easier example is using that pyramid obviously there's going to be a huge base to work from to be able to to get to reach to the top but do you think people don't retrospectively think of all the avenues as to why you want to obviously uh, look at uh, different avenues and look at a life outside of sport yeah i mean i think well i think even with para sport, with any sport, you know, I think that there, I mean, there's a lot more being done now, and it's improving massively. But um, I'm just trying to think how to phrase it. Um, people need to be comfortable right like, where they're going next. Um, coming off a program, even with the most supportive group around you. If you've not planned that, whether that's through injury, through um, not making the grade, it suddenly that after being so devoted and within that mechanism to come out of it is like really hard. And I know of a number of athletes that have retired on their own terms and they've been very surprised by quite how tough it is because you don't realise quite how much you gain and how ingrained with your identity the sport is, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's, um, so I think, yeah, I mean, if you don't plan for life after sport when you're an athlete, then I think you're doing yourself a massive disservice because, and you're just saving up a lot of pain for later on. Um, 
But then on the other hand, people are like, oh, you just need to focus on this now because this is your 100% because you want to get to this goal. But there's so many people trying to get to that goal and there are so many variables that can stop you from achieving that goal, however hard you work. Um, both in able-bodied and in para, but I'd say more so in para with shifting goalposts. You know, there are a lot of reviews of classifications at the moment. Um, as in the entire structure of classifications within sports, not in individuals, you know. There are a lot of sports that are suddenly being dropped or losing funding um, in the UK. And um, those things make a very big difference because if you're trying to be a full-time athlete, you've got to get funding. Um unless you're, like, stupidly rich <laughs> and very lucky. Um, you've got to get funding because you've got to live somehow, you know. Um, and there are so many things that can happen for that funding to be lost that are outside of control. You learn to control the controllables. Well, one of the controllables is going, right, if suddenly I was to be off program tomorrow for whatever reason, what am I going to do? And if you've got a vague answer to that question, then you're in a thousand times better place than if you don't. And, you know, if you've got an answer to that question, it's still hard. So I actually fell back into the coaching and I was thinking about going to the able-bodied VAR World Championships when I lost my funding. But psychologically, I found it really tough going back to all of the races and seeing my friends competing and, you know, um, so I just had to move sideways within my sport a little bit further. Um, and I ended up falling into another discipline and it was completely unplanned. It just happened. And it was brilliant. Um, it's been really good for me. So, yeah. And Francis, my final question for you before we wrap up today's episode, if you had to summarise this uh, episode we've been speaking about today into one sentence for people to take away, what would that be? I'd say that um, bad stuff happens to everyone and what makes us is how we get through that and tackle it. And once you've got a way of doing that, if you can just remember the last time that you got through a hard time, you know, learn from the things you get wrong in that and keep building on it. You'll get through the next hurdle easier than you did the previous one. And there's always light at the end of the tunnel because stuff just works out if you keep working and bleeping. <laughs> I think that's a great synopsis. So once again, Francis, thanks, for, thanks again for coming on the Mindset Game podcast. Cool, no worries. It's been my pleasure. Pleasure being all mine. And before I forget, I would really appreciate it if you would be so kind as to leave a short written review as it helps to get the podcast more notoriety and it will be more visible in future to others and thus helping more people, which my guests and I are all about. Once again, thanks for listening and I'll catch you next time for another episode of the Mindset Game Podcast.